اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته In the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the jammerlijkste, the genadigste. Alle dank en prijs komt toe voor Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, die baas van alle werden. Ons bedankt, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having guided us to this Yom al-Jumu'ah. We realize that without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance, we might never have been guided. الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنحتدي لولا أن هدانا الله. My respected brothers and sisters, as you know, on the very important hadith that we have entered into the second third of the month of Ramadan, and that the first third, according to the hadith, was dedicated to the mercy of Allah سبحانه وتعالى to the رحمة. The second third for the next 10 days are dedicated to the maghfirah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the beneficent um, um, uh, tawbah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's mercy, it's beneficent. And the third third that will follow soon is saving us from the fire of hell. These are very important framing ideas of what we ought to expect to do in the fast to attain Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's dignity. And so in this khutbah, I want to focus on the importance of Shahru Ramadan, the month of Ramadan for building, for cultivating the Allah ordained virtues Allah ordained the fada'il for good living, fada'il or virtues from Allah for good living, for moral living in complicated times, in complicated times that we are currently living. I begin with the risala or the message of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who experienced a year of sorrow and sadness, full year of sadness, that was known as Al-Aam Al-Huzn. Emphasis here is on Huzn. I will come back to this word uh, more than once during this khutbah. The year of Huzn means it is the year of sorrow, the year of sadness, and perhaps an apt word to interpret Huzn to you is the year of trauma that the Prophet ﷺ experienced in the 10th year of his message, in around 619 of his prophetic journey. Why? Why was this a year of sorrow and sadness? The Prophet ﷺ and his followers were enduring in this year a boycott from the Meccan tribal society. Remember when the Prophet and his small band of followers in the first years of the prophetic mission in Mecca was received with hostility by the Meccan tribes as a result of Islam that he brought shaking up the very ethical moral foundations of that society and which threatened the lifestyles of the people of Mecca. Therefore, they put him under threat in and around this time. They instituted a boycott against the Prophet wasallam, which caused the Prophet this trauma around about this year. So it was a difficult year. It was a difficult year made more difficult by the passing away of two of the Prophet's most foundational protectors in the Nabuwa, 
That was first the passing away of the first Muslim after the Prophet received Nabawa, that is his beloved wife Khadija, passed away in this year. And very soon thereafter, passed away his benefactor, Abu Talib. Abu Talib was the chief of the Banu Hashim. And so therefore, he was Muhammad wasallam's lineage protector. If why you wanted to operate and, 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 and practice your, your, your faith in the Meccan context as it was organized, you belonged to a lineage. The lineage had a chief. Many other chiefdoms had many other lineages in Mecca. And this lineage head, Abu Talib, was the guarantor of your safety. So that while you had him, the Prophet wasallam could reasonably practice and grow his Islam. But when Abu Talib passed away, that protection fell away. And the Prophet then was in search of finding a new lineage protector. He went out to Taif, asked the chief, the chief, the chiefdoms of Taif to support him and they refused. They treated him terribly until eventually he founded a new lineage protector. So in this particular, in this particular year, Muhammad وسلم, suffered a lot of hardship. There were not just threats on his life, there were real attempts to kill him and some of his followers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indicates to us that the Prophet received this hardship in the Quran. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Prophet and the Muslims who were experiencing hardship and sorrow and sadness and trauma and depression. I'm using modern words by which you can understand this language. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ali Imran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Muslims and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this year of sorrow. Al-Amu al-Huzn, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not weaken, dear Prophet, dear Muslims, and do not grieve or be sad or be depressed. Well, verily, when you, when, you, when you kind of refuse that, you will be superior in victory if, if you are true believers. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was communicating to the Prophet and to the Muslims is to stand firm, is to believe in Allah, is to believe in the ultimate victory that will come with the implementation of your moral mission. Your moral mission is the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fairness to human beings. Addressing human suffering and establishing the, uh, uh, the aman, the peace of Islam, insha'Allah. So this ayah alerts us to a condition of sadness and depression and trauma. And the challenges to wellness, our mental and physical wellness, in times of difficulty, the same kind of times that we're currently experiencing, global genocide, local depression, local poverty circumstances, human beings are struggling mentally, physically, psychologically. The Prophet wasallam took heart from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's reassurance because he makes a dua in the morning. The Nabi's dua in the morning speaks of his call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for assistance during these depressive traumatic times. And the nasiha to you today is to also make this particular dua, which is, in a, it is recorded in a hadith, O kama qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-huzn. The word huzn appears in this dua that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam makes in context of depression, in context of tribulation and trauma. When the Prophet in his dua asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, O oh Allah, I seek refuge from you, Ya Allah, from this grief, this sadness, and this trauma. So, you should and I know that huzn means sadness or sorrow or depression or trauma. My dearest respected brothers and sisters, from the times of the prophets 
ensuing generations of people all over the world take their inspiration from the prophetic model. And so similar depressive circumstances also confronted the pioneers of Islam in Cape Town. And presumably Islam in Stellenbosch as it was established around the 18th century. 1820s, 1830s, Muslims started arriving here and the first masjid was established in the 1890s. And there are some, some, some people here whose ancestors sitting in this masjid established this masjid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our four forebears inshallah. The Cape Town community, the Stellenbosch community found what? These colonial conditions, these supremacist conditions that they were dumped into as slaves or as impoverished workers, work workers, people who were suppressed by the colonial conditions, they found these conditions a huzn. They found it depressive. They found it harsh and dehumanizing. Well, just remember, and if you don't know, read up on this history, that one of the founding fathers of this community, he was called by the nickname Tuanguru, or Mr. Teacher. His name was Imam Abdullah Qadi Abdul Salam. Came to Cape Town, <coughs> banished after he had fought the Dutch, 18, 1780. And he was incarcerated in Robben Island. He wrote the Quran from memory, some say more than once. He wrote the kitabs that establishes our ilmul kalam from, from memory at, in Robben Island. He described Cape Town, my dearest brothers and sisters, as a Darul Huzn, wa Darul Laan. A Darul Huzn, an abode, a place of depressive conditions, a place of sorrow. Remember, and a place of, and an accursed place. Remember, they came here as slaves, banished, under colonialism. There was no community. They were uprooted from their communities in the, in the, in the Indonesian uh, archipelago where they stayed. They came here under conditions of chains and in slavery, and many of them went into Robben Island. Can we imagine the state of mind, the state of body that they had found themselves in, in that 17th century colonial Cape Town? Our forebears in the broader Cape Town and here, from the 18th century onwards in Stellenbosch. They, he called it a Darul Huzn, an abode, an abode, a place of sorrow. Responding then, however, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not be depressed because you believe in Allah. Responding then to the Quran's call to their situation, these early Cape Muslims were an example par excellence to us. Because they didn't take their situation lying down. They didn't accept their situation and wallow in the, look at me, I am, I am in a sad situation, I, cannot, I do not have agency. That wasn't the response. They immediately started building the infrastructure for Islam to flourish in Cape Town. Infrastructure by virtue of the first madrasas, the first masajid, the first schools, the first social welfare institutions for the community that was growing, a slave, some slave, a slave community, a free black community that joined them, and people from all over the world who came either as banished or people who came from different parts of the world. And they established the Cape Muslim community, the place of sorrow, they turned into a place of adaptation, into a place of survival, and into a place of creativity and flourishing where 300 years later, here we are, here we sit, not cowered by the conditions in which we find ourselves. They gave expression to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's bayan. Remember, and you want to go and look in uh, Surah Al-Rahman, whom you all recite, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, ar-Rahman, oh Allah the, the beneficent, Allama al-Rahman, Allama al-Quran, who teaches us the Quran, خلق الإنسان who creates human beings علمه البيان علمه البيان means that Allah has taught us language and speech and creativity 
and the ability to respond via our intellectual processing and our hard work to processes here. So we came into, our communities came into and they responded. So the lesson obviously for us today is that Hosen, a state of depression, is, must be, must be um, uh, we must require an understanding of it. We must be, we require an understanding of how trauma happens, how it can be, how depression happens, how it can be addressed, and productively we must understand how to thrive, how to establish community, how to establish the infrastructure for our survival. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the basis of all of this in Surah Al-Ra'ad. Surah Al-Ra'ad, the word Ra'ad actually means thunder. Dondervir. So it's an indication of the difficulty of change. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna Allah la yughayyiru ma bikawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusihim. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Verily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not change men's condition, human beings' condition, unless they change it themselves. There you have it, brothers and sisters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala focuses on the inner self, the nafs, in this ayah, in relation to the social selves, in a context of difficult change. That is what the ayah instructs us. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and our Cape Town forebears in their response rooted their behavior on the basis of Islam's spiritual legacy. On Islam's spiritual legacy because they were not about to be defeated. So, the lesson here is for us today is that based on a very, very, very acute understanding of our circumstances or they, their circumstances, Prophet Wasallam and our forebears, they activated, they utilized Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine presence and guidance. Because accessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Rahman, His beneficent, His beneficence was core to establishing their livelihoods. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains in Surah Al-Fatir, لِيُوَفِّيَهُمْ أُجُورَهُمْ وَيَزِيدَهُمْ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ إِنَّهُ خَفُورٌ شَكُورٌ Since, says Allah, He will grant them their just rewards and give them yet more out of His bounty. For verily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most forgiving ever responsive to gratitude, to shukr. So what is the lessons of our forebears? It is that as believers, they responded to hardship and sorrow and trauma and depression based on the necessity of accessing what? Accessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness and His gratitude. At the center of the response, is an attitude of forgiveness that human beings display, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, and expressing gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, building a disposition of gratitude. In other words, the idea that whatever na'am we receive from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will express the shukr, the shukr for that na'am in our lives. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains, good deeds are increased when founded on the emphasis on these virtues of maghfira and of shukr when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَمَنْ يَكْتَرِفْ حَسَنَةً نَزِدْ لَهُ فِيهَا حُسْنًا إِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ شَكُورٌ Again, the two ayahs. And whoever commits a good deed, we will increase for his good deed therein. So a good deed will be increased on the basis that you're doing a good deed. Because indeed, Allah is forgiving and ever forgiving and appreciative and responsive to our plight. What is the ayah signifying? We are bringing to this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings together Allah's maghfira, His forgiveness ever available to us, and His shukr, His shukr ever available to us, His gratitude, His appreciation ever available to us. These offers us a clean slate, the opportunity for a clean slate. It offers us pardons for past wrongdoings. 
and a recompense for one's good deeds. So when we've fallen back into a situation where you become unforgiving, where you become ungrateful, then Islam offers you the pardon. The pardon leads to just recompense. In other words, you have to change your behavior and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's reward is back to you. My dearest brothers and sisters, in the last few minutes of this khutbah, I want to say to you that the Quran teaches us that the sickness of ghafla or the sickness of heedlessness or forgetfulness or carelessness, let me repeat, ghafla means to be heedless, not to think about consequences of your behavior, to be forgetful, to be cavalier in your behavior towards others without thinking about consequences, and to be careless in your behavior. That is what ghafla means. The Quran teaches us that ghafla is the enemy of shukr. So if we are motivated or operate or behave on the basis of ghafla, shukr does not occur to us. We then push away Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's gratitude to us. The Mufassirin speaks about ghafla as one of the major, major, most devastating illnesses of the heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nahr, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ تَبْتَبَعَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ كُلُوبِهِمْ وَسَمْعِهِمْ وَأَبْصَارِهِمْ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْغَافِلُونَ those whose hearts and whose hearings and whose sight God has sealed, they are the ghafilun, they are the heedless. Your heart, your hearing, and your sight are sealed. In other words, your senses are taken away from you. Your senses are taken, you are unable to intuit, you are unable to feel. You are unable to understand your purpose in the world. You are unable to perceive what the, the real purpose in the world ought to be. Once you've reached that stage, you've become part, you, you have acquired a state of ghafla, which disqualifies you from entering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's maghfirah, which disqualifies you from, from attaining Allah ta'ala's appreciation, his shukr, and his, and his thankfulness. This is a situation that we have to mitigate, that we want to avoid. Because it is the ghafilun, it is these people, they neglect their responsibilities. They neglect the ibadat. They do not fulfill their obligations. They spread gossip. They destroy communities. And they live indulgent lifestyles. It is something that we, all of us sometimes fall into the traps of. And the, the, the nasiha of this uh, khutbah is for us to be utterly aware. To be utterly aware and conscious of when we fall into this state of ghafla. And the Ramadan, my dearest brothers and sisters, via our, our dhikr and our salah and our adhkar and our siyam, is the ideal time for us to remind us about the signs of us falling into ghafla. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy and forgiveness and shukr is available to even those who have lost their heart. Even those who have left, lost their perceptions and their mind and their sights, those are ghafilun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's maghfirah is available to even them. And it is in this month that we are able to access all of it. In this case, let me just explain and tafsir the word shukr. Is that shukr, what does it do in a context of ghafla? Shukr is the ability to access Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's gratitude onto yourself. Allah Ta'ala's mercy because shukr it allows you to unveil your weaknesses om jou swakhede te openbaar in fact that is an associated meaning of the word shukr kashaf, mukashafa it means to open up the bad and to reveal it to yourself so once this ghafla via the processes of shukr and mukashaf is revealed we open ourselves up to a life, life of gratitude and moral existence. But we have to do the hard work in making ourselves morally alert to our conditions in order to open up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rahmah. And in fact, shukr, once you engage in it, once you enter into it, from the very small act of 
showing gratitude towards someone that does a very small na'am to you, favor to you, to very big na'am, uh, 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 to, 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 to being um, 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 gr grateful towards all the small and the large uh, uh, na'am that people uh, uh, confer upon you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confer on you. Once that happens, shukr then has a multiplying effect. It multiplies because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah, Surah Ibrahim, وَإِذْ تَأَذْنَ رَبُّكُمْ لَإِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ وَلَا أَزِيدَنَّكُمْ وَلَا إِنْ كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيدٌ Surah Ibrahim, verse 70. Perhaps you must go and look up at this beautiful verse. So in translation it says, and Allah says, And remember the time when your Rabb, when your sustainer made this promise known to you. If you are grateful to me, I shall most certainly give you more and more. But if you are ungrateful, verily my chastisement will be severe indeed. Subhanallah al -Azim. From the word shukr, the one who is grateful is the shakir. The shakir is the one who internalizes gratitude. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to internalize the gratitude into our lives, inshallah. Then we can take the, the title Shakir because the Shakir is bound to receive Allah's mercy. But in contrast, the Kafir Shakir is the one who is grateful to Allah. Kafir is the one who is ungrateful to Allah. The, the, the exact opposite. Or the English word is the ingrate. Have you heard that word? The ingrate will receive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wrath. He, this leads him to disbelief, to kufr, and then he is on the wrong side of the scale. Therefore, accessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's fadail, his virtues, such as shukr and karama, must now guide us in our spiritual development and in our relations in these very huzn, in these very traumatic times. My dearest brothers and sisters, we know, speaking about our community context, that huzn, sorrow, depression are widespread in our communities, suffered by people who must make ends meet with very limited resources. Those whose attention spans are diverted by digital technology and social media and others who suffer a variety of physical and mental wellness challenges. If you all think just about a family member who suffered from one of these things or a friend or a community elder, it makes a lot of common sense to understand how difficult the times are that we're currently living in. However, we don't need a heedless or a ghafla response to this khuzn, as we've been trying to say. Ramadan offers us the spiritual and the physical resources to construct a caring society. Ramadan allows us the ability, if we're attentive, to interrupt what, what I'm calling here the so-called attention economy. Khuzn times often is constituted and made up of many things that take our attention away from our hearts it takes our attention away from our from our alertness it takes our attention away from accessing allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's virtue, vir uh, virtues sitting on the phone sitting idly and and, 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 and chatting during ramadan wasting our time steals us away it sidetracks us but the good news is as we all know is that ramadan tells us to switch off our devices to adopt and, and to switch off behavior that takes us away our attention away from virtuous living ramadan must persuade us as it has up until now to switch on behavior that secures a moral existence the purification of the soul, tazkiyah to nafs, reaches its very height during this month. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we practice our ibadat, that we carry our spiritually realigning personas forward during this entire month. 
and into the new year, inshallah. Because what Ramadan does in conclusion is that it fosters or cultivates our ability to, to maintain focused attention. When you are reciting the Quran or you're doing the adhkar or you're doing the tarawih, what it forces you to do is to pay attention. Is to pay attention to that to those virtuous connections to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will counteract ghafla. And when we have reached the state of attention, we are able to observe the beauty of the natural world when we walk. When we are in a ghafla situation, we don't see the plants. We don't smell the air. We don't see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's order and symmetry. In other words, we don't see Allah ta'ala's beauty of his creation. What connecting back to our attentiveness does for us is the ability to smell Allah ta'ala, Allah ta'ala's uh, creation. To, 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 to dwell within the natural order that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. Which then, once we do that, once we've reached attentiveness, we are then connecting back to our primordial self, our fitratullah, this self that we were born with, that ordained us to be morally virtuous people. And then we go off in our life and we, and we lose our pathways. But Ramadan switches the attention back onto where it needs to be and connects us to our fitratullah, which we all haven't been born with. That clarifies our true purpose in the world. We become what the Quran describes in Surah Al Imran, they are all in albab, people of reason, who contemplate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation of the heavens and the earth, the alternation of the day and the night, with awe and acute understanding. That is what we want to accomplish in Ramadan. We want to, we want to experience the divinity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all our behavior, our senses, our thinking, and our everyday behavior. Ramadan is the Moral, spiritual, moral and spiritual training ground for all of this. We make dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to maximize our worship so that we develop the spiritual elevation and therefore we can commit ourselves to being good in the world.